Let's take a look at another group of Irish gangsters, the infamous Westies Irish mob. The roots of the Irish gang known as the Westies were planted in the center of New York City's Hell's Kitchen neighborhood. This infamous criminal group rose to prominence in the 1960s after emerging from the seedy west side of Manhattan. Hell's Kitchen's hard scrabble surroundings were the ideal condition for the Westies to flourish and ascend to power. At the helm of the Westies stood Mickey Spillane, a charismatic and ruthless leader. Known as the Pope, Spillane's cunning and ambition propelled the gang's criminal enterprises. From extortion and loan sharking to illegal gambling and drug trafficking, Spillane's iron fist ruled over the Westies' empire. In order to avoid prosecution, Mickey Spillane took advantage of a power vacuum that had developed in Hell's Kitchen as a result of the departure of gang leaders in the early 1950s. Spillane, a local, served as Huey Mulligan's protege before eventually taking the helm. Huey Mulligan was the main force in Hell's Kitchen. Spillane displayed generosity by delivering flowers to hospitalized neighbors and providing turkeys to low-income households during Thanksgiving. Along with these charitable activities, he ran a number of illegal businesses, including bookmaking and policy-related gambling, all of which entailed loan sharking. Loan sharking frequently turned violent, resulting in Spillane's imprisonment for burglary. The most daring of his illegal ventures, however, was the Snatch Racket, which involved the kidnapping and ransom of local merchants and members of competing criminal organizations, further elevating his status within the community. Spillane entered into matrimony with Maureen McManus, a member of the esteemed McManus family that had controlled the Midtown Democratic Club since 1905. This union of political influence and criminal operations bolstered the gang's capacity to manipulate union employment opportunities and engage in labor-related corruption. Their focus shifted from the waterfront activities to more concentrated involvement in construction projects and service-oriented tasks at prominent venues like the New York Coliseum, Madison Square Garden, and later the Jacob K. Javits Convention Center. During the 1970s, the Irish Mafia faced a growing threat from the Italian Mafia, particularly the Genovese criminal family who sought control of the impending Jacob K. Javits Convention Center. Because the Convention Center was in Spillane's domain in Hell's Kitchen, he was adamantly opposed to any engagement by Italian factions. Despite being outnumbered, Spillane maintained control of the conference center and his neighborhood. Frustrated and humiliated, the Italian gangsters hired a renegade Irish-American assassin named Joseph Mad Dog Sullivan to kill three of Spillane's top lieutenants. Tom Devaney, Eddie the Butcher Comiskey, and Tom the Greek Capados. Their viciousness and brutality were infamous as they maintained control over their territory through violence and fear. Their penchant for murder and dismemberment earned them a chilling reputation making them one of the most feared criminal organizations in New York City. In 1977, Spillane met his demise through an assassination orchestrated by Roy DeMio, a scheme facilitated by Jimmy Coonan who aimed to assume leadership after Spillane's demise. Coonan formed an alliance with DeMio following an agreement between the two parties. The plan involved eliminating Spillane, after which DeMio's crew would collaborate with his successor. DeMio initially came into contact with Coonan after the latter had murdered and dismembered a loan shark named Ruby Stein. The battle started when Coonan, then 18 years old, vowed to exact revenge on Spillane for kidnapping and beating his father. This incident gave Coonan more motivation to exact revenge. In 1966, Coonan attacked Spillane and his companions with a hail of machine gun fire from the rooftop of a Hell's Kitchen tenement building. Despite the fact that no one was hurt during the gunshots, Spillane still thought Coonan was a serious foe. Spillane attacked Coonan's father in response, intimidating him physically and demanding that he control his son's behavior. On allegations of murder and kidnapping, which were eventually reduced to Class C manslaughter, Coonan was briefly detained. In the latter half of 1971, he was granted his freedom again, and he resumed his continuous struggle with the West Side Gang. Hell's Kitchen became an unsafe place for Spillane and his family, prompting them to relocate to the Irish working-class neighborhood of Woodside, Queens. This shift in location caused a decline in Spillane's grip over the criminal activities in Hell's Kitchen. While Coonan rose as the neighborhood's new figurehead, some continued to regard Spillane as the boss. Within the New York Commission, Spillane still held the title of the Irish mob boss on the west side, maintaining control over the Javits Convention Center construction site. However, Anthony Salerno, a prominent member of the Genovese crime family, had his sights set on the center and struck a deal with Jimmy Coonan. Under this arrangement, if Coonan assumed leadership, Salerno would oversee the construction site and share its profits with Coonan. To get rid of three important Spillane followers in Hell's Kitchen, Tom Devaney, Tom Capados, and Edward Comiskey, Salerno hired Joseph Sullivan, a freelance hitman connected to the Buffalo crime family. 
Kumiski seemed to have shifted allegiances to the Kunin side after he and Kunin both participated in the killing and mutilation of Patrick Paddy Dugan, who had killed Kamiski's close buddy. Salerno and Sullivan, however, were not aware of this change. Capitos died in January 1977, while Devaney and Kamiski died in the latter part of 1976. With Spillane gone, Kunin established himself as the sole ruler of Hell's Kitchen. Nonetheless, the decision was made that Spillane still needed to be eliminated. Roy DeMio, a member of the Gambino crime family, carried out Spillane's murder as a favor to Kunin. Mickey Featherstone faced trial for the murder but was ultimately acquitted. Roy DeMeo served as Kunin's primary contact when he established the Westies' alliance with the Gambino criminal family, which was then led by Paul Castellano. By 1979, Kunin and Featherstone had both been cleared of the murder accusations brought against Harold Whitehead, a bartender. Similar to this, James McElroy, another well-known Westies member, was exonerated of killing a teamster in 1980. Kunin was imprisoned in 1980 for gun possession, and Featherstone was imprisoned on federal counterfeiting charges. The Westies persisted in their illegal operations on the West Side, such as gambling, loan sharking, and controlling unions notwithstanding their imprisonment. Kunin's affiliation with the Gambino family changed after DeMeo's murder to Daniel Marino, a captain from Brooklyn. After Castellano's assassination in December 1985, John Gotti, who took over as the Gambino's head, became a direct participant in Kunin's interactions. Joe Watts was chosen by Gotti to serve as the go-between for the Westies and the Gambinos. The Gambianos occasionally used the Westies as hired killers. Early in 1986, Featherstone was found guilty of murder, but he soon started working with the police to get his conviction overturned. He thought that other Westies had set him up to commit the crime. His conviction was overturned as a result of the details and recordings that Featherstone and his wife Sissy gave. The prosecutor in charge of the case notified the judge that Featherstone's innocence had been established through post-conviction inquiries, leading to the verdict being reversed in September 1986. Following the Featherstone's discoveries, Coonan and a number of other Westies were detained on state accusations of murder and other offenses. Following this, federal prosecutor Rudolph Giuliani initiated a comprehensive racketeer-influenced and corrupt organization's RICO indictment against Coonan and his associates spanning two decades of criminal activities. Featherstone testified in open court for four weeks during the trial that commenced in September 1987. The trial concluded with significant convictions in 1988. Coonan received a 60-year prison sentence for various charges. Other prominent gang members, including McElroy and Richard Muggsy Ritter, were also handed lengthy prison terms, 60 years for McElroy and 40 years for Ritter, for offenses related to loan sharking and drug activities. The neighborhood of Hell's Kitchen's historic demographic makeup has seen substantial alterations by the early 1990s. A more varied and affluent population was rapidly replacing the Irish-American community of the working class. A decrease in street-level criminal activity and a change in the dynamics of leadership were brought about by this reform. Bosco Radonjic, an American-Serbian nationalist with a history of anti-communist activities, became associated with the Westies as a lower-level associate of Jimmy Coonan in 1983. Eventually, he assumed leadership of the Westies after the departure of Kelly. Radonjic played a crucial role in manipulating John Gotti's 1986 racketeering trial. Around 1992, Radonjic fled the United States to evade charges related to tampering with a jury. In 1999, he was apprehended by U.S. Customs officials during a layover in Miami, Florida. However, his release ensued when the main witness in the case, Sammy Gravano, was considered unreliable. Radonjic returned to Serbia, his country of origin, where he operated a casino and nightclub until his death in 2011 due to health issues. Involved in a burglary network that preyed on over 1,000 companies throughout Manhattan in 1992 was a man by the name of Brian Bentley, who surfaced as a Westie. Michael G. Cherkaski, head of the Investigations Division of the District Attorney's Office, responded when asked about the Westies' presence's scope, saying that too much of the gang was still present and that its influence had not yet subsided. Following the end of the Yugo era, there was little talk of the Westies' activities or continued presence for about 20 years. However, the Westies' recovery under John Boken's leadership was highlighted by the New York Post in 2012. Boken and his companions were detained for bringing marijuana into the country illegally. Despite being the nephew of former Westies members, the New York Times stated that Boken had no confirmed association with any group going by the name of the Westies. It's important to remember that the media first referred to the gang as the Westies in the middle of the 1980s. The gang's members never formally embraced this moniker or referred to themselves as the Westies at any time. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more character breakdowns and analysis of your favorite gangsters. See you in the next one.